Welcome to the Marinade with Jason Earl. I am thrilled to bring you Trey Crowder, the liberal redneck, an amazing comedian, a fascinating guy, and he dove deep into his creative process. Today's episode is brought to you by SJC Venues, operators of two of our favorite venues in all of Florida, the Ponte Vedra Concert Hall and the St. Augustine Amphitheater. Lots of great shows coming up soon. The National is playing. Uh, Amanda Shires with Coy Brannon. There are so many great shows at those two venues, and you can go to staugustineamphitheater.com and check out the whole schedule for either one. Trey Crowder today, y'all. I cannot believe it. I'm so stoked. If you're not familiar with Trey's work, I recommend you do a couple of things. So I recommend that you go on YouTube and just Google Trey Crowder, the liberal redneck, and a bunch of different viral uh, videos will pop up. They're videos basically selfie style of him ranting, about some particular issue. And what'll catch you off guard if you're not familiar with him is that he's a country boy. He's a Southern boy from Tennessee and you'll hear his accent. It's still pretty thick. And then he'll be talking about liberal causes. And I think for a lot of people that sounds like it's not real, but it is. Um, There's a lot of folks just like him throughout the South. And I can identify with a lot of what he feels in terms of being a Southerner, but also being pretty big on things like human rights. Uh, I I think what he's doing is really important work, and I want to get straight to the conversation as soon as possible. But I also highly recommend that you get a copy of his book. Uh, He, Corey Ryan Forrester, and Drew Morgan, his comedy partners, wrote a book called The Liberal Redneck Manifesto, Dragon Dixie Out of the Dark, and you can get it at any major bookseller. I highly recommend that you read that book. Um, Maybe do that after you listen to the show, but I highly recommend that you do so. And also their podcast, the Well Read Podcast is absolutely wonderful. It's kind of how I got into him, which I'll talk about during the show. Thank you guys so much for listening. Ladies and gentlemen, Trey Crowder. Opening my notes. Gonna talk to Trey. Starting with how I got into your comedy. Okay. My origin story. So, um, the I'm in the Dallas airport, and uh, I went to see Florida and uh, Michigan play at the at Jerry's World. Okay. And I'm sitting, and uh, I'd heard about you, and I'd seen a couple of your videos, and so I list. I just dialed up uh, an episode of the Well Read Podcast. And it was uh, Lydia Loveless, yeah, and who I was supposed to interview, and then the damn hurricane hit, and she had to cancel her show um, in Orlando. And it was a Papaw Batman, yeah. <laughs> that shit. I'm there sober. I've yeah. been sober for like three months at that point, sitting there stone cold sober in the Dallas airport, laughing my ass off. <laughs> that fucking well, riff y'all had. Thank you. Yeah, that was. One of the more ridiculous moments that we've ever had <laughs> on the tour was the Papaw Batman stuff because that it had started earlier that day, but very briefly we were out doing like radio appearances, I, yeah, in Huntsville, Alabama, and I don't even remember now what made it first come up, but we said something about you know Papaw Batman or whatever, and Corey had just made this offhand remark about how basically, you know. He thought he was going to basically, you know, meet out vigilante justice, but only once he's old enough to where it doesn't matter to him if he gets caught or goes to jail or not. So, like, in his 80s, <laughs> he's going to become, you know, uh, an infor- like a, the the punisher yeah. or whatever. And, his, and we were – and it was just an offhand thing, but me and Drew, like, laughed at him. We're like, yeah, we're, you know, okay, but clearly you can't do that. And – uh and he just wasn't having it. But we had to, like, go on air right after that or something, so we kind of just dropped it. And then later that night when we were doing the podcast, we brought it back up, and, yeah, it turned into a whole thing. Corey's one of those people that, I mean, you can't you can't tell him nothing <laughs> at all. Well, and the whole the whole exchange is hilarious that for those who haven't, um, those listening to the show, uh, if you haven't done it, go back and listen to it. Uh, but the whole thing's hilarious because, and it kind of speaks to sort of what y'all do in general, is that it's this ridiculous idea, but you're real. It's like a, there's a nuanced argument that goes into both his argument, yeah. and then also you punching holes, y'all yeah. punching holes in his argument, yeah, <laughs> which is a, a really fun thing that comes out in the book too. 
I read it. I yeah. love it. Oh, thank you. The Liberal Redneck Manifesto is fantastic. Um, and I think there's so much we're going to have to resist the urge to just jerk each other off about our taste in music. Yeah. <laughs> there's just so much in here that I'm just like, yep, yeah, fuck Jason Isbell. Yep. Yeah. Drive by Truckers. Yep. Oh, yeah. Lee Baines. Y'all had Lee Baines on. We did. I yep. had Lee Baines on. Yeah. Awesome um, dude. Yeah. Amazing dude. Um, and so, But there's so much in here. And I wondered like what the creative process looked like writing that thing. Man, that 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 thing, that book, that was one of the wilder experiences uh, I've ever had. Because, well, first of all, I didn't. I, one thing I never expected was for a book to be one of the first things that yeah. I ever really did in my comedy career. Yeah, you know, I didn't know where my comedy career was going to end up going ultimately. Uh, but I do know that I again I didn't expect to be writing any kind of book for a long, long time. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. it's like usually I feel like that type of thing comes at the end. Yeah, you know, looking back or whatever. So that was that was part of it. Is that we never expected that to happen, but it just came up. We basically when I first went viral, me and Corey and Drew, the guys I tour with and who wrote the book with me, we had a blog at the time that like nobody cared about, you know, Mm -hmm. but then once I went viral, I mean, people started reading it because they were finding me and then finding the blog. And this lit, a literary agent saw the blog and saw us or whatever. And just, uh, reached out to us and was like, you know, I think you guys should write a book. And we were like, all right, you know, what, how does that work? And then we start going through the process and we got, she got us a book deal and we had to put this proposal together of what the book would look like. And basically what was in the proposal is what the book pretty much ended up being. And so it's like, there's, was it, I think it's thir- is it 13 chapters? Mm-hmm. There's 13 chapters and each one is about a different, like, aspect of the south uh, like a stereotype of the south some of them are good and some of them are bad so you know there's a chapter about the music or the food and there's a chapter about religion and one about guns and poverty pills. racism pills all that yeah. and uh in each chapter we try to just kind of break down the uh you know what's real and what is you know the perceptions with each of those things or whatever and so that was the proposal we put together, and they, the publisher went for it. And then so then, so by the time we, it was time to start writing the book, we had already kind of outlined what the format of it was going to be. So we knew we were going to have these chapters that were going to cover specific subjects. So the, what we actually did was we split those subjects up amongst the three of us, and we would each go and write you know whatever chapter we were doing that week so if like if it were a week or two weeks we wrote that whole book in like six weeks because they That's wanted it insane yeah i know it's insane i realized I, we knew it was crazy at the time but i realize how truly insane it is now that i've met other people that have written books or whatever and i you know i tell them that and they're like what <laughs> yeah. you know i know the i know these two uh these two lady comics out in la or friends of mine they just got a book deal and they're writing a book and they have like, they have like, I think it's like 18 months before they're having to turn their manuscript in or whatever. Oh, they what they wanted because it was like somewhat political in nature. They wanted to have it out before the election, the 2016 uh, election. Uh-huh. And in order to make that happen, we had to have it written by X date. I think it was sometime. I want to say it was sometime in June or July. I don't remember. And from the time we signed the contract, to that date was six weeks. So we had six weeks to write it. And uh, so, yeah, whatever, you know, so in any given week, it'd be like I would be working on the chapter on pills, Corey would be working on the chapter on food, and Drew would be working on the chapter on Jesus or whatever. And we'd make deadlines for ourselves. So by Thursday, everybody's got to turn in their draft to each other. And so I'd give them mine, and I would get theirs, and I'd read what they did and, you know, add any notes or whatever else I had. And then on top of that, we each added uh, other things to each other's chapters. So there's those porch talks in there or whatever, yeah. where it's like personal anecdotes relevant to whatever that chapter's about. Right. So, you know, Drew was doing the Jesus chapter. I'd have two or three 
little sidebars like that that I had committed to writing for that chapter that I'd also have to get to him by whatever the deadline was. And that and so we just pass them back and forth and then, you know, move on to the next chapters. And uh that was pretty much how it went, you know. Um and then we we had kind of like a third party editor person who we our mm-hmm. lit agent. Mm-hmm vouch for and was like she you know she's great and she was great you know she does she's you know she could be a big help to you guys and she was so once we had finished that process with us it would then go to her and then she would you know send us send it back right with notes and whatever and then we'd polish it from there and that's pretty much how it went and we would we talked on the phone a lot like we each week Mm. whatever we were you know whatever chapters were coming up that week we'd have a call on like sunday night or something where we would basically outline to each other, you know, what our idea was for how we were going to approach it. And then, or if I, you know, if I had something, Hey Drew, I think you should make sure to cover this aspect of the chapter on guns, you know, or that type of thing. And we'd take notes and whatever, and then go out and do it. How does that, when you, what about when you write, um, it's, it's a lot so, so much in there. Cause it's so, it's wild to me that first of all, you wrote it that quickly, but also just like the rise of everything so quickly. I mean, yeah. I was listening to the, to episode one of the well-read show uh-huh. this morning. And I, like I said, I caught, I caught it at the Papaw Batman, yeah. which is like 15 or yeah. something like that. Yeah. So then I went back and I was like, I'm curious about those first couple of episodes. It sounds like a totally different mm-hmm. thing, you know? And, and there's even a thing where I, Corey comes on and talks about the fact that like, Hey, you know, bear with us with the, you know, with the, the sound quality at that point, but it yeah. sounds like a completely different thing. Well, we did, honestly, we should have a uh, speak of the devil. That's probably Corey right there. Yeah. Hey, there he is. Hey, Corey. Hey, Corey. Nice to meet you, man. Nice meet you, man. It's a pleasure. We were just talking about work. you. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely fine. Okay, cool. Oh, you doing Garage Band? Oh, man. If we, we should dork out about this at some point because we were just talking about how, like, I can't. It, this is the biggest hassle for me. Yeah. How long you know? are you doing? Um, this is episode nine, I guess. Oh, I, dude, you'll figure it out. But, but. I do Garage Band too, and it is simpler. You do Garage Band? Yeah. It's like once you figure it all out, it's just dragging. Like, it's, it's the only interface I found that is literally just drag. And place here, which is just like so much fun. The editing part doesn't bother me. It's the like inconsistency. It's a MacBook Air. Well, it's and also a, um, mine is too. But I don't. I didn't know that you could just go straight into it like that. Yeah, that's the that's the that's the fuckery of it, though. I think is the challenge. That's the challenge. Right. Yeah. You may want to just get a recorder and dump everything on there. Yeah, I think that's probably the plan. Are you hanging out tonight? Uh, I I'm debating um Great my times. yeah the, I saw them open for Isbel in uh, Saint Augustine. Oh my God! Um, yeah, if you're hanging out, we'll talk, or you can email me. I'll shoot you everything I know about the bullshit. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, it, pleasure. Later. Uh, yeah. Are you? Do you have a ticket, or are you on the list, or anything? We can put you on the list. I really appreciate it. I am. Uh, it's a tough thing because <laughs> shit. <laughs> our uh, our dog is 16, and oh. we thought we were gonna have to put him down. Um, Oh damn! Like a week and a half ago, mm-hmm. my my girlfriend and I, and and he was like, she broke him out of his embryonic sac, so and she's almost thirty, so think about that. Like she was like yeah. a preteen when she first had this dog, and I love him to death, but um, she you know has raised him, and he's been there through the ups and the downs and everything. Right. So I really want to go to the show. I don't have a ticket, um, but I'm gonna after we do this, I'm just gonna call her. Yeah. And just see how he's doing. And okay. How she's okay. Doing. Well, I'll I'll tell I'll tell the manager and put your name on it either way. And if you can make it cool, and if not, that's fine. Too. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I understand. Yeah. Uh. Anyway, yeah, it was a totally. We. I mean. We didn't know what we were doing, but like we didn't even know the extent to which we didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> you know what I mean? And yeah. it just—it's like Corey was saying, and like we. It just, I mean, it just took, I, I shouldn't even say us. It took him a while to just, you know, figure it out, to just sort of figure out how it works, The you know, the at just the technical aspects of it. Because, yeah, we didn't know how any of that shit worked. And, 
Yeah, I mean, it's definitely come a long way in terms of the quality and stuff. But again, I mean, I that's basically all Corey. Like, mm. you know, I, I can't really take. So what do you do? You, ju- you just show up and start talking, basically. Or? Well, no, I mean, yeah, sometimes, but usually we'll have some idea of what we're going to talk sure. about that week. Uh, so you know, we'll we keep a group text going all the time. So you know, on like Tuesday, if we're so we'll probably record an episode, I would say, either tonight or if not tonight, definitely tomorrow. Um, I mean, we'll have to before tomorrow's over because we go back home on Monday for a few days. But anyway, so I'm like, if we're going to record on Saturday or Sunday, you know, on Tuesday or Wednesday, if Drew has an idea for something he wants to talk about, he'll text it to everybody like, hey, I want to do this on the podcast this week or whatever. And we kind of just keep track of it that way. Um and then there's other little things every now and then with that we've only recently started doing where like uh like Corey and Drew rapped on there or Drew mm-hmm. leaves Corey these voicemails on yeah, there yeah. like and I did one a couple of weeks ago with a like left Corey a voicemail as a fictional character you yeah. know and that so we're starting to mess around with some of that type of stuff too. We also have kind of went away from I, we realized at a certain point that there's no there's no rules when it comes to your own podcast i mean you could do whatever you want yeah. so and we weren't thinking about it that way at first so when we first started we needed we were interviewing people like every week there was an interview subject but it was getting tough because i don't we we're not centrally located mm-hmm. I, I live in la now Corey still lives in North Georgia, and at the time, Drew lived in New York. Now he Mm. lives in Tennessee again. But the only time we're together, we, the three of us are together a lot, but we're together on the road. So, like, for us to interview somebody, like with Lydia Loveless, that was in Columbus, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, We, if we were going to a place and we knew of someone in that place, that we thought would be cool to interview, we would try to set that up while we were there. But, like, that don't always happen. You know what I mean? Like, that didn't happen in Des Moines. Right. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, like, yeah. so it was just getting tough to keep up with the interviews. And then we just sort of realized, like, well, we don't, I mean, we don't have to do that. Yeah. You know, and we, so, like, we still do, it, but when it works out or when it makes sense. And then otherwise, we just, you know we just recorded ourselves and it's not been a problem at all so yeah it's been a definitely a learning experience for us but um you know it's been fun too yeah that that's such a great point about it and that's one of the things i love about this is that it is completely freeing i am my editor i am my producer i am my own i book all the shows i do whatever i want you know and if i just feel like if i felt like just talking into the microphone i could i don't think that would be very compelling but if i wanted to I can right. do it, and that's the beauty of it. Yeah, you know, definitely, it's just you. Yeah, and I guess that's part of like stand up too, to some extent. With you guys, it might it's a little different since you are a bit of a team, but like, and but that's also the challenge is that when you're, I would imagine when you're up there, I mean, it is just you. <laughs> so yeah, no, that yes, that's one of now I, there are rule. Well, you can obviously there is a whole a lot of freedom in stand-up comedy i mean more than a lot of other art forms i think but at the same time there are rules in stand-up meaning that you know you can't just go up there and just dick around or just you know what i mean or just right. you know just be talking like you got well really the only rule is you need to be funny i guess <laughs> but yeah. i mean that's easier said than done but yeah if, if you long as you can make them laugh or whatever that's fine yeah did that just kick back on? Yeah, it just kicked back on. Okay. Is it that's weird. No, it's set now? to off over there. Just flip it flip it to off right there. Well, that didn't work. I don't know, man. I mean, look, you can see. Can you see yeah. over there on the thermostat? Yeah, it says it's off. set to off, so I don't know. Ah, uh, whatever. Here, I'll just go to yeah. locate. Yeah. Uh I'll roll over. Anyway. There. But oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> um just kicked off if y'all can't hear that uh i feel like i forgot what i was saying oh stand up yeah. yeah it's uh but yeah it that is that's the thing with it is that you are just up there by yourself like i used to, I, I was a stand-up fan and like a comedy nerd for years before i ever did it i mean you know, ever since i was a kid i was super into it and so 
And I always thought that it was one of the like purest art forms that there is because it's just a person and a microphone yeah. and, a, and an audience, you know, which sometimes it's the audience is one person, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. but, but yeah, that's all that there is to it. And, uh, and I've, I've talked to a lot of musicians in the past couple of years who have said to me like how insane that is to them. Like as musicians, the like I, I've had multiple mu- and like musicians who I love and respect, like Jason Isbell or Patterson, Patterson Hood or Mike Cooley or whatever, all tell me like that how crazy it is to them the idea of just walking up there alone. Right. You know, they're like, yeah, I come out with either the band or even if I ain't got the band, I've got the instruments and I've got the songs, you know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. I, I, you just walk up there and just start talking and that shit is crazy to me. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, you know what they do is equally insane to me also, but yeah, it's just one of those things that people, I don't know. You're either like wired for it or you're not, I guess basically, but it is, that's what I like about it is that there's no, there's no studio or anything when it comes to my material. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's no studio. There's no network or like, you know, record label to use a mu- music analogy. Like it's just, it's me. And I just have, I live and die by whatever I come up with to say up there, but I'm not beholden to anybody else or anything like that. I don't have to have approval or whatever, that type of thing. Do, do you, when you write, jokes are you usually right alone do you work with other people no i'm totally completely alone um well i mean initially at least me and Corey and drew i mean yeah we help we help tag each other's jokes all mm-hmm. the time so like if you got an existing bit or something that like Corey's working on and i listen to it and if i think of a line that i think is funny mm-hmm. for the bit that he's doing i'll tell him be like you know what i think you should try and then he'll either try it or he won't. And if he does try it and it works, then he'll keep it. And it works the same way in reverse. You know, he gives me tags or Drew also. But the writing of the bit initially, the material itself, yeah, is a lot. We all do that a lot. There might be some comedians who don't, but it's pretty standard for it to be kind of a individual process or whatever. Most people don't do it. There's guys that once you get – huge reach like a certain level there are guys who pay younger comics to write jokes for them which Mm -hmm. is like i'm i'm fine with that but outside of that i don't think there are very many stand-ups that don't write alone would you ever be comfortable with that yourself paying somebody Mm -hmm. no i've always said no and my answer is still no right now i think but I will say I'm already realizing, like even at the level that I'm at and the stuff that I have going on, I'm already realizing how hard it is to keep up with writing fresh material or whatever. Uh, I'm still, I'm doing okay right now. I'm still hanging in there. Like my set that I'll do tonight is, it's from when the tour first started. I mean, it's 90% or better different and then from a year ago it's about it's probably about 50 percent different something like that so it's kind of it's kind of like a i don't reach like a date where i just shut it off and then the next day all new material starts like i'm kind of constantly mm. you know turning over certain jokes or whatever so it you know <clears throat> it moves around a little bit that way as i go but with you know when you've got other stuff going on or you know can be insanely busy at times like i have been lately yeah it can be hard to write new materials so like i definitely sympathize with anybody that does that way more now than i ever have but again having said that i still have no intentions of of ever doing that myself like i would definitely prefer to keep writing all my own jokes you know for forever now if i had some kind of show you know a show where i like had a monologue or something on it you know what i mean like that Mm -hmm. type of thing then yeah of course i mean that to me that's completely different you know you have your writer's room or whatever and i do that all day but for my stand-up though the hope is that i'll just you know be able to keep that up myself i mean that's the plan when is when do you write jokes uh, it depends kind of just when the 
sometimes I do set aside time. Like I'll, uh, I'll think, okay, I need a new five minutes for this showcase show I'm going to do in LA or something. Cause I'm only doing 10 minutes and it's a good time for me to try out something new, but I don't have anything new. And that show mm-hmm. is on Wednesday night and it's Tuesday right now. So I'll think to myself Wednesday during the day tomorrow, I need to go out, uh, go out back or something mm. and try to bang something out. And then I, wait, I don't know about Corey and Drew. I know this is fairly common practice, but I keep a running list of like, ideas for stand-up bits but they're just idea you know just a thought of oh that might be funny and so whenever i think to myself i need to write something that day i'll go out i say go out back i have this like little like office it's it's kind of a guest house but it's not really it's a little shed basically in my backyard Uh in burbank and i'll go out there and i'll just start going down my list of ideas uh and I, I'll pick something that, uh, you know, strikes my interest at that time. And then I'll just try to turn it into a stand-up bit. And, you know, huh. sometimes it works out. Sometimes it doesn't. And if it doesn't that day, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to throw it away or nothing. I'll, you know, I'll come back to it later. Sure. But, yeah, that's pretty much that's pretty much it. And when I say try to turn it into a stand-up bit, and now this I know is not what everybody does. This is, you know, the process varies from comedian to comedian. But what I actually do is, so I'll look at the list, I'll find an idea for a bit. I'll be like, okay, all right, that. I want to focus on that for a second. And then I just start talking out loud like I'm like I'm on stage doing it, but I'm not. I'm pacing back and forth in my guest house or whatever just talking it out and it's pretty stream of consciousness free flowing stuff you know what i mean i'll i'll just talk about the subject or the, or the angle the idea that i have for a while and then hopefully there'll be a funny line or two in there and if there is you know and then i'll start over and i'll keep those funny lines and i'll try to think of some other jokes and other parts of it but it's all i'm talking the whole time yeah like i don't i never sit down and like write out uh anything stand up wise really yeah uh i never have i um i've always had a really good memory for that type of stuff like once i memorize something it's up there usually so again i have a, i have a list in my phone of so there's okay there's the list of ideas for bits yeah then there's a separate file that is a list of bits that I do, but in that file, it's not the bit written out. It's just like the title of a bit, basically, yeah. you know? So like I'm doing a bit right now that's about, uh, rednecks and cops. Uh-huh. And in the, so like in my phone, that bit is just called rednecks and cops. Mm-hmm. So that's all that's written in there is those three words. But that bit is like seven minutes long or something. Yeah. But I've never written any of it down completely because I've always felt like if I I know how I am. And if I did that, I would feel like beholden to every single word Uh, in the script, as it were. Yeah. If I wrote the whole thing out, I'd be trying to recite that verbatim. Mm. And if I didn't, if I missed like one word on stage, it would feel like I had fucked up in my head. Right. Even though. I, nobody knows. Nobody, nobody can tell. Yeah. But I would tell. But if I don't ever write it out like that, then I don't, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't factor in. Well, and I wonder also, like, because so much of what you do is kind of rooted in authenticity, right? Like, you, yeah. that's one of the things you talk about is, like, you are who you are, and you're pretty open about who you are and where you came from and that kind of thing. So I wonder if you scripted it, whether you would lose a little bit of that edge. Yeah. You know? No, I think that's a very good observation because, yeah, that also is part of it because then I feel like it can end up coming across as more of, like, reciting, you know? Yeah. Reciting of lines or reciting of jokes as opposed to I, I like for it to feel more, you know, conversational or whatever. I mean, I it's not a conversation. It's a monologue. I don't want to, yeah. you know, I'm not trying to start a dialogue with anybody in the crowd. I, you know, dislike <laughs> hecklers as much as the next comedian. But just in terms of tone and how it sounds, yeah, I want it to sound 
that yeah more authentic or like more natural i sure. guess and i think yeah if i scripted it out word for word i do think it would lose some of that so that also is part of it yeah yeah but some guys you know uh write everything down you know what i mean and yeah. i mean some of the greats too like me and Corey were talking last night there's a scene in that – there's a Netflix special out right now called Jerry before Seinfeld, mm -hmm. and there's a scene in there where he's, like, at a park on a bench with all these pieces of paper laid out around him. And, I mean, like, it's huge. It's, like, the size of a damn – not a baseball diamond, but, I mean, it's a huge area that's just covered up with paper, and it's every joke he's ever written because he's written every joke down he ever since he started 30-whatever years ago. Yeah. And he's kept them all the whole time. And, you know, and, I mean, he's a Mount Rushmore guy. Yeah. On the other hand, Louis C.K., I know, doesn't ever write anything down. You know what I mean? So, like, it just depends on the person. And I've just always been one that was more wired to not write it down. And so yeah. I don't. You know, we'll see. As I get older, you know, who knows. But for now, that's how I'd go about it. Yeah. Um, I want to turn a little more lighthearted. Well, no, wait. Not yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not yet, because you mentioned Mount Rushmore. So I wanted to, uh, in the book, you guys talk about Dale Earnhardt a little bit. Uh -huh. And uh, I have very rare occasion to talk, get to talk a little NASCAR on the show. And I wonder if you remember where you were when Dale died. Yep. I was at uh, my buddy Rooney's house. His real name's Justin, but everybody has called him Rooney for years. We were uh, We used to hang out at his house all the time after school and during the summer and stuff like that. And so we were over there that day and had been, I'm pretty sure we used to go over there a lot. Cause he had a computer with, you know, dial up internet and stuff mm -hmm. on it. So we, I, I think when that happened, we were doing that. Do you remember that? Uh, God, what was it called? The, uh, Okay, cream savers. You know cream savers? Like, they're life savers, but they're, like, vanilla. Cur they're, like, orange cream and raspberry cream flavor. Yeah, it's yeah, candy. yeah, yeah, yeah. Called cream savers. Did you ever play that cream savers mini golf on the internet? No. <laughs> okay, who makes those? Life savers, cream savers. Is that Wrigley or Nabisco? Oh, or who I have is no that? idea. One of those big companies. Yeah. Those they had They had a website. That was filled with all these little mini games uh, that were like candy sports themed. And they were hugely popular in my school, especially <laughs> that the mini golf one. Yeah. Uh, and we used to go over to Rooney's house and play that shit all the time. And that's what we were doing when that happened. It was We had it on the TV and we were just dicking around the computer like we always did. And that's when uh, that went down. Yeah. It's crazy. I was uh, I was in college at the time. And I had a roommate called Buddha. His name was Ryan, but everybody called him Buddha because he had a belly and was really skinny otherwise. And we didn't process whether or not that would be offensive to anyone <laughs> right. in any way. But he was a big he was a big NASCAR fan, and and, he, and I was a, I grew up a fan. You know, growing up and I grew up in Central Florida, so growing up right down the street from Daytona. I yeah. was a fan, but I, but he was a like an obsessive fan, and he was an obsessive Dale fan, and I remember watching it happen. We were drinking, so I you know, I, I guess like my perception was definitely off, but I remember watching it and being like, it, it's just a wreck. Yeah, no, that's what we thought too. Yeah. We thought the same thing. Uh, I remember distinctly thinking that, like, we one hundred percent did not think that he had died or anything. What's crazy is know? Buddha knew. It's like he had this. Uh, this understanding yeah that was it. Corey. it was either Corey or drew i think or maybe it was one of my other buddies i was talking to somebody very recently who said there were no adults around when we, i said i mean we were we were like i want to say we were like freshmen or sophomores or something so i mean we were teenagers mm -hmm. and uh yeah that would have been sophomore year anyway but there were no adults around but Corey or drew or somebody told me uh, we were ha telling this story the other or, you know what it might have been bj barham actually shut the fuck up i actually think it was bj barham because he has a dale earnhardt tattoo yeah and uh we were talking about it it was it was him he was what he was watching that with his dad and we i we said some version of what me and you just said which is like, you know when it first happened it looked that bad to me and bj said that 
he was watching it with his dad, and it was like his dad knew immediately. Interesting. Like the instant it happened. Yeah. He knew that it had killed him or whatever. And he and he cried. That's what BJ was talking about. So like one the, it's like one of the only two times he ever saw his dad cry. Oh, that's why when that happened. <laughs> yeah. God, I love BJ. Yeah, he's awesome. He was episode one of my show. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty pretty dope. Um, I wanna do a little th- we're we're coming up close to the uh end of our allotted time here, but I, I and I don't want to take too much more of your time, but I wanna do do a little bit of uh hits or don't hit. Okay. For you, okay, <laughs> all, right. all right, yeah. Um, we'll start kind of easy and kind of kind of ease into. It. We'll start with the NASCAR theme. Jeff Gordon. I'm gonna say hits because of my grandpa. He was my late grandpa's favorite driver. Hmm. Because he was good. Yeah, he that's was why my grandpa good. used to build and race stock cars himself back in the day. He had oh, all these wow. trophies and news clip, paper clippings and shit in his basement. And so he was super into it, but he but he had an appreciation for talent, yeah. like all the all the stuff that people didn't like about Jeff Gordon. Yeah, he didn't give a shit about because of how good he was. Well, I whatever. think that's really interesting. So I'll that, say like, hits <laughs> as a fa- as a fan. We have different expectations than like the the person that actually does it. You know, like right. uh, comedians have have favorite comedians mm-hmm. that maybe the public isn't as crazy about because right. you appreciate their craft in a different way. You yes. Know? Um, what about a uh, pop music with banjo in it? Don't hit. Oh, fuck, it does not <laughs> hit, man. I don't. I mean, fuck. I don't want to be that guy because yep. I mean, there is some of it, I guess, that is. But I mean, just as a general rule, I don't. I don't fuck with almost any pop music sure. for the most part. But any of it, yeah, that has a band. Any of that, like. I mean, yeah, it, like it offends me on a personal level. <laughs> like it really does. I was yeah. talking. I've recently, me and Corey and Drew have talked about this, and I was talking to a buddy of mine in Nashville recently about it too, about like how we realized that the like radio country music, you know, which is just like pop music and you know plaid shirts basically with like yeah. a twang. It's just garbage. Sure. How we hate it so much, like hate it. Yeah, but the equivalent of that in hip hop, we're like totally fine with. Mm. But yet there's re- and like we like good hip hop too, but that the like radio poppy version of hip hop, I'm not saying that you know we love that shit, but we're pretty much fine with it. Yeah, you know it doesn't like bother us, and I think we came to the conclusion that's like because. That doesn't that that doesn't reflect poorly on like my culture or whatever oh, the way that shitty country music does. Yeah, like shitty country, shitty radio country music. Like again, is personally offensive to me sometimes. Yeah, but like radio rap, I'm just like yeah, all right, you know, whatever. Yeah, you know, like, and I think that's wise because I don't have that like personal connection to it. So any of that type of stuff that's like, for lack of a better term appropriating yeah <laughs> hillbilly shit you know yeah. into that kind of like pop sheen or whatever yeah i'm not not a fan yeah at all i agree so far i well i don't know about jeff gordon i, <laughs> <laughs> I don't i don't i don't know either way um let's get let's, let's oh wait justin timberlake uh playing with chris stapleton that hits for me does it yeah because i like now, see, I just said everything I just said, but Timberlake doesn't make country music, though. I mean, he's a straight up pop guy, but I actually really like Justin Timberlake. Sure. He's from, he's also from Tennessee, mm-hmm. and he's like, you know, a proud Tennessean. He had a production company for a while called Ten Man, T E N N Man, mm-hmm. or whatever. And he's, you know, astronomically talented yep. in a variety of ways. So I've just. I've always I've always had love for Timberlake, and I like Chris Stapleton too. So them collaborating on stuff is fine with me, just because I'm a fan of each of those guys. I guess the the reason why I brought it up at all is somewhat controversial. Is just the sense that like I kind of want Stapleton to be like our, for the lack lack of a better word, guy. And I understand that he kind of transcends, you know, because he's able to sell a bunch of records and and be on the radio and that kind of thing. And I. I know that how pretentious that sentence probably sounds, but still, uh, there's something different about him working with Timberlake 
that just seems like it's a little more of the the radio friendly that yeah. I'm re- that I'm okay with. You yeah, know? no, I, I hear you. I know what you're saying. It's just like I said, I you know, if it was I'm trying to think of a good example, but I can't like and I, and I really don't have any problem with this dude, but like if it was Stapleton and Justin Bieber, yeah, would not hit for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just like I just like <laughs> yeah, I just yeah, like yeah. Timberlake also, sure. so I think that's what the thing is with me, but and I I agree with what you said about Stapleton, but I've always taken more of the uh perspective of like I th- I, I'm glad because I think Stapleton's legit, yeah. and so I'm glad to see a guy that's legit, yeah, making some headway in those like mainstream channels or whatever. Because I hope that that will be, you know, maybe it'll set a trend. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like maybe there'll be more and more guys like him on the radio as opposed to Florida Georgia Line and that type of shit. Yeah, I think that would be cool, but that's I don't know if that's going to happen, but. That's how I try to look at it. That's a really good attitude, though. That's a better attitude than mine. I like that. I'm going to adopt that. <laughs> uh, riding, uh, riding drunk. Hit or don't hit? Uh, hits at the time. <laughs> Usually don't hit later. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever written anything drunk. Yeah. And I woke up and was like... <laughs> yeah, right. But while you're doing it, you're like, this is it. Yep. Yeah. No, that, that's definitely one of those things where... Yeah, it depends on the persp- where you're at when you're looking at it. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're still drunk while you're reviewing it, you're probably like, oh, "That's great." Yeah, but if it's the next day, don't hit. <laughs> well, like riding one beer deep, that's different, right? You know, for me at least, I, I can't speak for. Yeah, no, I yeah, absolutely. I mean, that it's like we, I'm that way with performing too. Actually, mm-hmm. I don't. I have been on stage like truly drunk like i mean less than five times ever yeah and i couldn't tell you the last time it happened because really early on in one of my first appearances on the main stage at side splitters comedy club in knoxville which is where i started Mm. the first weekend i was on the main stage just doing guest spots but on the second friday show during my guest set because i used to get super i was still so early into it that i would get so fucking nervous and it was my first experience with two shows in one night. So I'd shown up on Friday for the early show and started drinking to calm my nerves and then went up and had a fine set. But I just kept drinking throughout that show mm. and into the start of the next show. So by the time my set came up in the second show, I mean, I was fucking blitzed. And it was a nightmare. I mean, it was t- I bombed my ass off. It was fucking brutal. And like... it was, But it was a good early learning experience for me, though, because I remember thinking like, while on stage still drunk i remember thinking like this was a bad idea and i'm not gonna do this again (laughs) and so like i don't out but but the reason i brought this up yeah but i like to have a couple drinks before i go on stage but but that's it like i don't go on stage hammered ever because it you know it sucks performance suffers when you have two sets like that do you because i would think that like the the performance is such a high Uh right and then you come, and then you have a lull between sets. Yeah. So you there's like a come down, uh-huh. and there's that feeling, sort of like you know anybody after work has that feeling, and they got to go to some place. Like for some people it's booze, for some people it's weed, for some people it's a run. You know everybody's got something though to unwind. Yeah. What do you do in between if you're not to prevent from say drinking? You know or we. Usually what happens is if we have two shows, there's like a meet and greet or something in between them. So after the first show and before the second one, we're meeting fans and talking to them. And then when it, when by the time that's over, it's time for the second show to start. And so, I mean, I've still got like 40 minutes because I have the amount of time that Corey and Drew are on stage. But mm-hmm. I have less than an hour before I have to go back up there. So it depends on... You know, if I'm hungry, I order something to eat real quick or whatever. But like, I don't. Typically, it's not enough time for mm. me to get like, you know, to crash or anything like that in that way. Right. Usually, like it's a quick enough turnover that I just kind of, you know, turn around and go back up and do it. Right. Uh, for the that most part. Sense. What about uh, riding? So we we did riding drunk. What about riding high? 
I, dude, I can't. I don't do almost anything high. <laughs> like I can't. Like, I don't function well at all. Yeah. Uh, like yeah. ditto, man. I, you know, I I watch Netflix <laughs> high. Sometimes I'll play video games, but like even that. Even that sometimes that is like I can't keep up with it, yeah. especially the way fucking games are today. Yeah. You know, nowadays like they're so they could be fucking intense, man. And like yeah. I don't even I've had to turn games off before. It's just like I can't fucking handle this shit right now. Uh, but yeah, so I don't. Yeah, I don't write high ever. Yeah. And so I, I'm amazed by people who do things. Me too. High. I can't. Yeah. I can't do anything. I mean, I'm convinced that, and I mean, I don't, this isn't some groundbreaking statement, but it's just, there's no way that, like, I know guys, like, there's a guy, Josh Wolf, right? He's all, he's a funny-ass comedian, and he's a big, he's a big weed guy, and, like, I know that he'll eat, like, like a fucking 100 milligram, you know, cookie or something like that, and, like, if I have 15 milligrams Again, I'm out. And he'll do that and fucking go on stage or whatever and be fine. Yep. And there's plenty of guys like him. So what I'm saying is th- it's I refuse to believe that marijuana affects me the same way that it affects that dude. And I mean, I'm talking like chemically. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. It cannot be making him feel the way that it makes me feel. Yeah. I refuse to believe that because anybody that feels the way I feel would not be able to go on stage and do an hour long set or whatever and yeah. just, you know, function. Yeah. Because I can't. Yeah. Again, I still can enjoy it because I, I can, it can help me just like chill out and again, mm. you know, watch fucking. Game of Thrones or whatever, and it's sweet as fuck, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but so, like, I mean, I could get into it, but I can't do shit on it. Like, it's for me, it's end of the day, everything's over. Mm. I'm just fucking, yeah, trying to unwind and then go to bed. Basically, yeah. I can't. I can't do it if I have any kind of shit to do. Yeah, it just gives me an anxiety attack. I just, I just oh that no oh, that that too, yeah. but. That too, if I have too much at all, mm-hmm. I'll freak the fuck out. Yeah. But now I live in California, where it's legal and you can, there's consistency to it. Mm-hmm. You know what you're getting. You know what I mean. Every time, it's not just a bag of something from some dude. Yeah. Now that I've lived out there, I've learned I can uh, play to my tolerance very well. Oh, that's you know what nice. I mean? Yeah. I've learned exactly what I can and can't do when it comes to that. So the freaking out, I don't deal with as much anymore for that reason. But if I ever fuck around and accidentally have too much, I mean, yeah, I, it will give me fucking supreme anxiety and shit too. And, and that is a fucking nightmare. I can't stand that shit. Oh, it's the worst. And there, there's nothing, there's nothing but time that cures it. Just wait. Yeah. <sighs> just wait it out. I mean, I, I got enough anxiety on my hands sober. Yeah. I don't need to, to speed up the process, introduce some kind of drug to speed up the process. Yeah, man. I could. No, you're right. Um, all right, uh, this might be a good one to end it on. Um, drinking beer while pooping. That hits. <laughs> <laughs> I've definitely done that. Uh, you just reminded me of one of my favorite jokes uh, ever, and I don't know if it's going to translate because the guy that – it's a joke that a buddy of mine that I came up with in Knoxville, Tennessee. He still lives in Knoxville. His name is Jeff Blank. It's a joke that he used to say. It was just like a one-liner, but it's shit used to kill me. Uh, the first time I heard him say it, he would just go like uh, – I don't want to butcher it. He would say like – so the other day I was listening to Slow Ride. Uh, the other day I was in my apartment listening to Slow Ride, drinking a. The other day I was in my apartment listening to Slow Ride, drinking a Miller Light Tall Boy, and naked taking a shit. And it just occurred to me, man, the terrorists didn't win shit. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, and scene. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.
shout out to Jeff Blank. Man, that's great. Trey, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Such buddy. a pleasure, man. Oh, I really absolutely. appreciate it. I'm a huge fan of what you're doing. And, you know, we didn't even get down about some of that stuff. I just want to tell you that I, I think what you're doing is important. Well, I thanks, brother. It, you know, it's it's comedy is important and what you're doing specifically um, getting the word out about things that really matter in a way that also entertains people um, ma- is really important work, and I hope you realize that, and I hope you feel that. Well, thank you, buddy. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks for having me. All right. Cheers, man. Trey Crowder, y'all, what an amazing conversation. That was so much fun. Thank you, Trey, for going so deep into your process. Thank you to everybody for listening. I got to see Trey, Corey Ryan Forrester, and Drew Morgan play an amazing set after this conversation. And it was just such a good time. If they're coming to your city, you got to check them out. It's totally worth it. Um, You can catch them at uh, wellreadcomedy.com. You can also catch their podcast, and I highly recommend that you subscribe to their podcast. I don't miss one. Such great dudes, really smart, absolutely hilarious. You can check us out on facebook.com slash marinade podcast. You can also go to Twitter at marinade podcast, at marinade underscore podcast on Instagram. Subscribe to us on iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play, anywhere that you consume podcasts. Thank you guys so much for listening. Cheers, y'all. Hey, I'm going to do another segment. There's something new here. Something that uh, I don't know if it's interesting or not, so please give me some feedback and let me know what you think. I'm just, uh, you know, I always ask people what they're listening to and what they're reading and what they're consuming. Um, And a lot of times people are asking me the same thing. So I thought maybe I would be interested in in kind of what I'm consuming right now, what I'm reading, what I'm listening to, that kind of thing. I'm, I'm totally obsessed right now with Seth Walker's live album. It's wonderful um and and you expect that from seth right so that's just kind of kind of par for the course um it's a a live record at mock chunk i probably butchered that pronunciation opera house and the the band didn't know that it was recorded live they're just playing their set and it was being recorded and it is unbelievable so check that out seth walker's new live record uh live at mock chunk maybe Opera House. <laughs> but if you type in Seth Walker Live, I'm sure you can find it. Uh, it has all, It's pretty heavy on his, his most recent record, which I'm a big fan of and have mentioned on the podcast before. And of course, he was a guest on The Marinade, and we had such a great conversation. And, and I look forward to catching up with him again next time he comes around or we're in the same town. Um, I've been reading, I, I just read the Liberal Redneck Manifesto, as I mentioned on the show today. It's fantastic. Go get it uh, and read it. I think it's really important work. I also, right after that, read ta Coates' Between the World and Me. If you haven't read ta you're not familiar, go do that. It's a... I can't do it justice in terms of praising it and, and talking about how important it is. Just trust me on this one, ta Coates' Between the World and Me. And then I'm also reading Larry Brown. And the, and the reason I'm reading Larry Brown is because they, the, the guys at the Well-Read Comedy Tour mentioned him on uh, on their podcast they told a story about being in oxford mississippi and and sort of the influence that larry brown has had on oxford and the culture there the literary culture of the south in general and uh i started reading a, a, a collection of his short stories called big bad love and um you know it's funny i, I realized while i was reading it that i tend to write like whoever i'm reading <laughs> i guess it's just sort of like that's the stage of my writing evolution that i'm at right now and and thankfully i consume really good writers for the most part and larry brown's no different i found that all my stories and and things that i'm writing tend to sound like him right now um which i'm totally okay with so those are the things that that i'm kind of getting down on right now stuff i'm feeling i thought you might be interested i love y'all thank you cheers